Welcome again to our regular podcast, our innovation series podcast, actually, where we speak to some of the people doing amazing work um, around innovation on the continent. Um, today, we've got a special guest, um, Mr. Ibrahim Sanusi. Um, Mr. Ibrahim Sanusi is it's got a special place um, and within the work that we do and within our network because of the amazing work that it does um, generally around, around the space. I'll let him speak um, to, to what it does, um, the work it does. I'll let him introduce uh, himself. Um, so Ibrahim, if you could introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about who you are, what work you do as it relates to the innovation discussion. All right, thank you very much, Demola. Um, and hello everyone, my name is Brian Sanusi. I'm the, an advisor on the Citizens Participation and Innovative Data Use for Africa's Development Program uh, of the German Development Corporation Office to the African Union. Uh, and my work revolves around three main things. Uh, the first is how we uh, integrate and increase the engagement between the African innovation ecosystem and policy spaces uh, like the African Union uh, at the continental level. Uh, the second element is uh, broadly around the intersections between uh, technology and governance and how uh, the African continent, uh, of course, uh, leverages the possibilities that technology provides in inclusive participation, uh, in demanding for accountable and transparent governance, and also deepening uh, democratic practice on the continent. And of course, the third broadly is around how do we get citizens to leverage their agency uh, for improved uh, governance on the continent. Great, and, and it's great that you're coming into this conversation with a little bit of the public side. So I'm going to start the conversation from there, actually. Um, almost every time you hear uh, public officials speak, there's always a talk around young people need to innovate, um, young people need to innovate. And it feels like passing the buck. Um, do you think this innovation discussion is therefore misguided? You think it's an opportunity to tell people, you know, just go do your thing. Well, I, I, I think that, yes, there is a sort of this dismissive or, if you like, escapist approach to uh, the way public uh, officials speak uh, when it comes to young people and then sort of, you know, laying the book at their feet. Uh, yes, there is a space for young people to, you know, take leadership uh, and provide guidance on what needs to change, uh, whether that is done through innovation or through technology and all of that is one thing entirely. The other point is that uh, broadly, the role for one enabling, you know, young people to be able to dream uh, and deliver innovative products and services and ideas uh, lies largely in the hands of the government. The government needs to provide the space and this space could be in terms of, you know, what level of education do we provide that inspires innovation? Uh, what level of infrastructure is put in place to allow individuals, uh, you know, try out tests and also implement their innovation and ideas. But also there is the, you know, the, the opportunity that it also provides for young entrepreneurs to also partner with the government in terms of developing, you know, tools and services that helps uh, to improve, you know, uh, development outcomes or governance outcomes for citizens. Thanks. You're already speaking to some of the points around um, what innovation in, in, in the governance and, and civil space could look like. But before we go into that, I just want to take a step back and ask you a question I always ask you. Um, I've asked the brand this question for seven years um, since I've known Ibrahim. Um, why should we end? I'm sure that? I have not given a convincing answer. That's why yes. it's coming back. I have to put you on the screen and ask you publicly. Maybe this time I'll be convinced. Why do we need to engender public participation? Yeah, I, I, I think that the point uh, on why we have to engender participation uh, is that if we leave government to, uh, to politicians and the government people themselves, uh, there is a tendency for uh, complacency, that's number one. Uh, there is a tendency for, uh, I don't know, inefficiencies. Uh, and, you know, the nature of democracy in itself is that there has to be contestations and contestations does not necessarily mean fights or argument or protest or whatever. Sometimes it could be, 
you know, provision of uh, new ideas that challenges the status quo. Uh, and participation allows you to do that. Uh, it allows uh, those who are go governing to one, uh, be on their toes, uh, be focused on the agenda, which is to deliver the governance and development outcomes to the people. Uh, however, for the people themselves, it also creates a sense of ownership uh, and provides them an opportunity to be able to, uh, you know, contribute their own ideas, uh, take ownership for their own development, uh, and then broadly also, uh, in a way, uh, helps to provide alternative options that could be considered in how we uh, advance uh, governance and development issues on the continent. So, why do we have to do it? I think, uh, one, it is because uh, we cannot leave governance to only the, those governing. It has to be a collective action of those governing and those that are being governed. Great, and I just want to kick back on that point you, you made around alternative options. And I think that the allure of innovation is the fact that, you know, it's an opportunity to, I mean, the term innovation in itself assumes that you're presenting an alternative um, option. So could you speak a little bit around some of the perspectives or experiences that you've seen around alternative um, options um, to the governance and, and, and citizens' participation discussion? Um, and, you know, in what themes? Is it around, you know, education or, or is it around you know accountability well I, I think it's it's in many areas uh, and if you look at the I mean what is now called the civic tech space in Africa um, which sometimes you know we often reduce to just civil society using technology I mean civic tech in its broadest form uh, sort of looks like um, well looks at one gov governance tech which is how government uses technology to uh, improve service delivery, uh, provide accountability to the people, uh, encourage transparency in its uh, uh, governance processes and all of that. And then there's the element that speaks to advocacy, which is how do we use technology uh, to improve advocacy uh, with the people, uh, with the government, with private sector, with faith-based organizations uh, and other actors in the field. And then you also have the element that speaks to how we use technology to improve the electoral process. Uh, and we've seen in quite a number of countries, uh, many examples of how citizens or even governments are leveraging uh, these tools. What we're seeing in Africa, and this is my own uh, position, is that um, there needs to be a lot more exchange and you know, interface between those who uh, do this in the civic, uh, you know, in the private sector, civil society space, and those on the policy side. You know, the interaction between the GovTech and the advocacy and the and, and the electoral processes tech uh, kind of community. Um, if you look at in Kenya with Mozaledo uh, that does uh, you know Parliament Watch and all of that, you know their role is to you know uh, one put what the parliamentarians uh, do in the legislature in the open space for citizens to know to engage. What are the issues that are being debated? How does how do these issues you know sort of affect? in everyday uh, life of the people and all of that and how does this empower the citizens in themselves to ask informed questions uh, from, 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 from the government. Whether Africa likes it or not, technology has come to stay. It will continue to play a huge role in how we design and now we develop, uh, now we implement uh, public policies uh, and I think that we need to begin to use this in a way that also fosters inclusive participation and engagement across board, not just of those in the tech system or those in society, but also of women groups, of youth groups, uh, and other vulnerable groups that we have out there. So for me, uh, I, I would say that there are several, several, several examples. We can go on and on and on and not about it. The accountability labs, uh, you know, trying to also create some kind of incentives for uh, ethical and moral public service officials, whether it's in South Africa or in Liberia or in Nigeria or in Kenya, you know. So there are quite a number of these budgets, uh, which is a, a budget transparency uh, program uh, in Nigeria, Liberia and, uh, and Ghana uh, and all of that. So we have many of them, uh, but to make them work, you know, the entire ecosystem around them needs to be strengthened. Uh, yeah. Great. Um, and I like that final point around, you know, need to strengthen the ecosystem. And I think you know, your second point around, um, you know, that intervention um, between various actors um, within the ecosystem. Um, 
you know, there is the argument that that might not necessarily um, be a good thing, um, because you know, in most of these countries, you'll find that the reason why that relationship is there is because they get funding, um, um, largely from the government. So government will fund civil society, will fund at least in Europe, um, will fund academia to it to, to to a large extent. And I think that on the African continent, um, there is that that distrust. Um, so the minute there is some sort of relationship with government, um, um, people think you've, you've gone to the bad side, you're now one of the bad guys. Um, so how do you think we can do this? How do you think we can build trust while being mindful of, of, of the rationale um, 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 around, around all of the interactions with them? Well, I, I think the issue of building trust is definitely a, a key issue on the continent, and it goes right to the heart of the issue of, of the discussions on, you know, the social contracts in Africa, you know, uh, and recently someone was uh, speaking on another platform uh, and saying, what is, you know, what is the value, you know, what is the brand equity of our governments to our people? Why, why should people, you know, trust the government? You know, what does the government deliver to the people that makes the people think that, okay, uh, this government, you know, um, is one that is trustworthy, honest, uh, and serves my purpose. Uh, and I guess that it goes to the basics of, you know, the fundamental principles of any government, which is to, you know, protection of lives and property of the people, you know, pro uh, providing socioeconomic uh, development and, you know, access to the people and all of that. Uh, and if you look at many of our countries with rising inequalities, whether it's social, economic, or even political, um, this trust is difficult to build in the absence of all of, 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 of all of these. So for me, I think that first to build trust, governments have to continue to, uh, have to begin and continue to deliver to the people. Uh, for me, that is very key. I think that when people have some level of trust in government, uh, then there is also, you know, uh, a level of, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, accommodation that it can provide to people engaging with the government. Uh, I do not think that fundamentally people are opposed to uh, civil society or private sector or, you know, all the other actors engaging with government. I think that it becomes a problem uh, when, you know, people look to all these other institutions as alternatives to the government. Uh, and, you know, gov they think that the relationship between these alternatives and the government is likely to also close up, you know, the opportunities they're probably getting from that side, whether it's an opportunity to call for accountability and transparency in terms of civil society, or an opportunity that they get in terms of providing alternative ideas and, you know, uh, uh, alternative theories to the public policies that have been implemented and all of that in the case of an academia. So for me, um, the government has a huge role to play in, in, in the way that it communicates, you know, its, its commitments uh, and what you call good intentions to the people. And the way to do that is deliver basic services to people, education, health, you know, environmental uh, sanitation issues, um, you know, uh, infrastructural development, you know, just the basic bread and butter issues that we are all familiar with. Um, we do not think, uh, and I know that there are so many data to throw up to talk about that. You cannot look at the poverty level on the continent. You cannot look at the level of literacy uh, or the illiteracy levels. You cannot look at the mortality rates uh, and think that to some extent government merits the trust of the people. Uh, and to do that, they have to solve those issues. Great. Um, I actually really like that point around um, expectation from um, other spaces and thinking that uh, public thinking that they will lose um, and that value they get from those spaces if those spaces get connected uh, to government. I would have loved to unpack that, but unfortunately, um, we're running out of time. So we'll quickly go to the quick round um, right now, and then we'll end the conversation. Um, how would you describe, I, I think you've got a five-year-old um, child, actually. How would you describe your job to your son? How would I describe my job to my son? Yes. I think more as a guider. Um, I see my role with him as a guider. I mean, and I and I, and I say this because when you look at, um, you know, the, the the, I mean, we like to think of ourselves as millennials and all of that, 
Uh, and then that my kid, uh, of course, like many other uh, young people that we have today, younger people today, they are Gen Zs and all of that. So the argument is that, you know, we tend to think that we probably have the same kind of, you know, dreams, aspirations and ideals and all of that. But, you know, when you look at these very young kids nowadays, it's different. Uh, and we have to, you know, if we also want to be a little more transformational than, than the generation before us, we have to create a space for their own um, character to develop. We have to create a space for their own, you know, personal development based on their own ideals and how they see the world, their own worldview uh, to shape. Our role, I mean, my role as a father is uh, to say, you know, provide guidance um, to some extent, provide some level of positive role modeling. Uh, and, and, you know, at the end of the day, I totally believe that every individual should be able to chart their own path. In Cut. Would you sorry? Um, I, I didn't do. Um, I, I didn't explain um, this one to Ibrahim, but I didn't want to cut him because I liked what he was speaking to, so I wanted that to remain. So, um, Ibrahim, I want you to answer in a phrase or a sentence. Um, Aha! Sorry, I'm a guider. Yeah. yeah. No. No. If your son comes to you to say, "What do you do for a living?" How would you describe your job to him? Oh. If my son says, what do I do for a living? Wow. In one sentence. In one sentence, uh, making the government work for the people. I like that. What do you dislike about your job? What frustrates you about your job and the space? Processes, bureaucracy, processes. And, and what do you love? What do I love? The ability to be able to impact on you know, issues that go to the heart of the people. Okay. And final question as we as, as we round up. I'm a young person sitting in, I don't know, any, any city in Africa. Um, I, I'm interested in the civic space. I don't know what to do. I've got some background around how to innovate. What would your advice be to me? Where should I look? Well, I, I think that um, the, the central point about innovation is solving problems. Um, and I and I think that we often look at solving problems as something very massive, that uh, what, what qualifies as a problem is something that is massive and you know, affects thousands and millions of people. And so if we do not do something like that, we feel like we're not doing uh, enough. But you know, uh, my advice would be, look at your immediate environment. What are the needs in that environment? Uh, what kind of innovation or, you know, uh, or methodologies are you able to introduce that helps to reduce, you know, the challenges that people face uh, or the plights that people have to grapple with uh, on, 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 on a regular basis? For me, I think that problem solving is at the heart of innovation uh, and from, it should be the first go-to. Uh, I know that there is a space uh, and I recognize that the space for you know, uh, what you, I like to call fantasy ideas uh, and projects and all of it. And I think that if you look at some of the bigger uh, and very interesting uh, tools that we use today, like Facebook and all of it, many of them sort of started out uh, like that, you know, things that people like and just wanted to do for themselves. And it has now transformed into what has been useful tools for many years. Uh, and so there is a space for that as well. Uh, but for me, I would say in the context of uh, Africa, uh, where we have quite a number of challenges and grappling with what you call, you know, developmental evolution and all of that, um, you know, uh, solving solutions and providing alternative uh, approaches to, you know, realizing an Africa that is well governed, that is independent, that is, um, you know, prosperous, uh, will be the way to go. Thanks, thanks a lot, Brian. It's been a pleasure having you here today. Um, I wish we had a lot of time. There's so much, there's been so much to unpack, but unfortunately, we don't have time to unpack it. Um, hopefully, you buy us coffee um, one of these days and uh, we'll have much more time to speak about this. Um, thank you um, and goodbye. Thank you very much. And it's nice uh, sharing the last few minutes with you. <laughs>